that the president of that era was only the fortunate victim of social forces and a national mood over which he had no control. That may well be true, but when the forces demanded and the mood permitted, for once an activist, human-hearted man had his hand on the levers of power and a vision beyond the next election. He was there when we and the nation needed him, and oh, by God, do I wish he was there now. But the try... The try, however, will be made again in other days to come. Between now and then, the building process must continue to try to put together those disaffected millions whose political concerns place them properly with the present and not the past. All of American politics for the future could take as its credo a statement written nearly 50 years ago by Dr. Du Bois who said, I believe in liberty for all men, the space to stretch their arms and their souls, the right to breathe, the right to vote, the freedom to choose their friends, to enjoy the sunshine, to ride on the railroads uncursed by color, thinking, dreaming, working as they will in a kingdom of God and love. Finally, he said, I believe in patience, patience with the weakness of the weak and the strength of the strong, the prejudice of the ignorant, and the ignorance of the blind, patience with the tardy triumph of joy and the chastening of sorrow, patience with God. Thank you. I think it's uh, quite clear that uh, there is enough for a thoughtful panel to chew on after uh, the speeches that we've heard this morning. Could we ask uh, Burke Marshall and the members of his panel to come up, and Mr. Bond and Dr. Williams, would you take your places over there? Oh, yeah? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the question. We will have a the format of the next, the we will have a panel here who will discuss among themselves some of the issues that have been raised in the addresses thus far in the symposium and particularly this morning's and then we will ask them also to consider questions from the audience. Thank you. To introduce, uh, I, I'll, I think there's probably no need to introduce the gentleman at the far end of this table who will uh, take part in this morning's proceedings. Next uh, to him is Yvonne Brathwaite Burke, a member of the California Legislature who will now go to the United States Congress in January to represent the 37th District of California. <laughs> Dr. Williams, you've heard. Next is Vincent T. Jimenez, former commissioner of the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Clarence M. Mitchell, Jr., Director of the Washington Bureau of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. (laughs) 
Congressman Henry B. Gonzalez from the 20th District of Texas. Many in this audience will remember the moderator of this panel as a most effective Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights from 1961 to 1965. He is now Deputy Dean and Professor of Law at Yale Law School and a very old and good friend of mine. We're all delighted that he is with us, Mr. Burke Marshall. <laughs> the rules for questions from the audience will be the same as yesterday. If you have questions you want the panel to consider, raise your hand to attract the attention of an usher. He will give you paper and pencil. Please write your question out, return it to the usher. The ushers will deliver them to Mr. Marshall, who will shuffle through them as best he can. The, uh, our experience yesterday uh, did show us clearly that there will be far more questions than the panel will have time to consider. However, I want to repeat what I did say yesterday. We will take the questions that are unanswered. We will ask the various members of the panel to respond to them in writing so that they can be, the questions and the answers both can become part of the published proceedings of this symposium. With that, Mr. Marshall, I turn it over to you. Thank you. Uh, what I would like to do is ask each member of the panel to uh, say whatever is on uh, his or her mind. I hope that uh, each of you will uh, address the future in as specific terms as possible uh, in terms of an agenda. The uh, speeches that we have had have all made the point, I think, that we knew at the beginning of the 60s what our agenda was then. It was to uh, clear away uh, legal segregation. Uh, I think that it is not nearly as clear what the agenda is for the future, putting aside the question whether or not we have a political climate now which will act upon the agenda. So I would like to start with you, uh, Congressman Gonzalez. I guess that uh, for the time being I will pass over Professor Williams and Mr. Bond and come back to them afterwards to comment on the others. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Marshall. I welcome the opportunity to say that, of course, attention here in the two addresses has been concentrated <coughs> on that aspect which, of course, should concern us, and that is with the most visible uh, minority of all. In this part of the country, we have other ethnic groups that have and have had parallel histories, perhaps from the legal standpoint not as severe because after all it was only the black or the Negro who had the Jim Crow statutory provisions, the state constitutional inhibitions and other uh, ordinances and laws that uh, legislated race into the corpus of legislation. However, in practice, and in the economic field particularly, uh, such groups as the Mexican descended, today popularly known as the Mexican American, has also confronted very serious challenges. I'd like to point out that contrary to what may have been the impression created by some diverse reports, this particular group in Texas, Southwest Texas particularly, and throughout the southwest of the United States to California did give uh, Senator McGovern and the Democrats overwhelming majorities, perhaps unmatched anywhere else in the country. I know that in my district, though it isn't an electoral majority, this group voted five, six, seven to one in favor of the Democratic Party and its candidate. There's no question that the sense of direction is a most urgent crying need in this area which has been generally described as civil rights. There is a lost sense of direction that I seem to detect on the national level, particularly in the Congress, but this is reflected in the contradictions 
that I'm sure most of us thought of as we heard the two speeches, or three. For one thing, we have the complaints and the grievances which are stated and implied, directed to the re-elected President Nixon, but uh, there are no manifestations or demonstrations uh, against the Nixon administration, particularly uh, in the last three years of his term of office, and they were very definitely there during the Johnson years. It's interesting to raise the question, what accounts for this? If Mr. Nixon and his administration really symbolize such uh, crude and obvious uh, disparity and indifference towards the basic cause of civil rights, how come there is no rioting and no outward physical manifestations of the proportion that we had during the president that we are praising and his administration? I'm not drawing conclusions, I'm just saying that it's a question that is agitating the minds of many other Americans. I think that when the entire American nation is confronted with serious intrusions into its basic civil rights, which involves by indirection the minorities included therein, that we all have a problem. And when the Congress has passed by overwhelming majorities laws that vitiate or water down the first, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth amendments to the civil rights, uh, or rather the Bill of Rights, and uh, this is done with apparent acceptance and almost national consensus, I think we are in deep trouble. And I think that we do need some uh, sense of direction, both as to priorities in their level of civil rights as well as to basic economic and political civil rights, generally speaking. Now, Clarence Mitchell, as several people have pointed out, is the fourth branch of the government and has been for many years. Uh, Mr. Mitchell, I know that you have several things you want to say, but I hope among them you will answer the question what kind of a legislative agenda you see uh, for the next uh, few years, I'll say few years, on the theory that it may not get passed immediately. Well, Bert, I wonder how this country has been able to survive with so many creep hangers that I hear uh, talking about how we're all on a road to total destruction and uh, there is nothing we can do about it. I would say if the atmosphere of defeatism, giving up and uh, confusion that I have sensed in some of the things that have been said here and some of the things that I hear around the country had prevailed among those like yourself, Ramsey Clark, Roy Wilkins, uh, uh, Jim <laughs> Farmer, Martin Luther King, uh, Whitney Young, and others, when we were working for the passage of the great civil rights legislation, I don't think we could have ever gotten that bill, those bills passed because uh, the cards were stacked against us, the dice were loaded, but we won anyway. And we won because we had a strategy. Uh, for that reason, I uh, would address myself to the question of strategy which Hubert Humphrey uh, touched on in his uh, remarks uh, when he presented uh, them to us. Uh, you remember he said that uh, even though we had the great marches and even though we had the great demonstrations, it was after all 75 days before we could get the 1964 Civil Rights Bill to the state of passage in the Senate. Uh, we were able to reach that day because we had at the helm a very able and effective leader in the person of President Lyndon B. Johnson. And I want to say that the students who attend the institution here, the John Gronowski Heads, are really getting what I have already had, and that is 
I, along with Hubert Humphrey and some other people, are the, uh, I'm a graduate of the Lyndon B. Johnson School of Politics. <laughs> My first lesson on that came about five o'clock in the morning when we were just waiting out an all-night filibuster being staged by Senator Strom Thurmond. And the president, who was then the majority leader and in his pajamas, uh, called me down to his office and said a number of things about the way the fight was going. Then he said something that I've never forgotten and I continue to live by, which is, Clarence, you can get anything you want if you got the votes. Now, how many votes have you got? Well, we didn't have money in those days, but we had sense enough to hold together what we had, and uh, we were able to win. We have never assumed that uh, all of our strength in the Congress of the United States comes from the Republican, uh, the Democratic Party. We don't write off the Republican Party because uh, we couldn't have won any of these bills except that part of the Dr Johnson strategy included bringing in uh, those parts of the Republican Party that would work with us. I have a picture on my wall. It shows a little uh, piece of paper laying beside the President of the United States. And uh, on that slip of paper, there are some names. Uh, those names were there for this reason. We had a meeting with the President for the purpose of assessing our strength in the Senate in connection with the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Bill. And I said, Mr. President, you have taught me well the lesson of you can get what you got the votes to get. Here are the votes we think we've got, and we outline them. And here are the votes that we think you've got to get. The first name on that list was Senator Everett Dirksen of the state of Illinois. I think that has been the characteristic of all of the efforts that we have made, and it has not been a battle that could have been won by the black people of this country alone. Uh, we have had to go to the uh, Chicanos. As, uh, Congressman Gonzalez is always number one on the list that the Chicano people take, not because he is not committed, but we just uh, believe in touching base with everybody. And so it goes. We have some people who go to the churches and some people, uh, church-oriented people and uh, others. Uh, in spite of what people may say, it must be remembered that in the year 1962, uh, 72, we took a piece of legislation which was so controversial that uh, people were afraid to discuss it in many parts of this country and uh, many got defeated because they were for it or even spoke out against it, namely the enforcement powers for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Uh, we did that in spite of the fact that the administration wasn't with us. We did it because we had Republicans and Democrats working with us. And an interesting footnote to that is it was one of the things that the Republicans put in their platform as evidence of what they had done in the area of civil rights. Now, we are, in a, we are in a situation now where we've got to face the fact that the time has come to stop playing games. Uh, we need the support of organized labor if we're going to get anywhere in the Congress of the United States. We need the support of other organized groups. And to pretend that there's some little thing that can be accomplished by all of the black people of this country getting together off in a little corner and making a decision and then selling that to the country uh, is delusion. And I therefore think that in our legislative objectives in the Congress of the United States, uh, we have got to think in terms of those broad objectives that we have always known we've needed. We need a minimum wage law to protect everybody in this country. And therefore, it deserves a top place on the agenda. And we've got the votes to get a minimum wage law passed if all of us will stop making speeches about how awful things are and start getting some votes in order to get that legislation passed. <laughs> we don't need to complain and cry about the fact that people are in need of health care. We all know that. But there is health care legislation that can be passed 
in the Congress of the United States, whether the president is for it or not, if we mobilize the people who in turn will help us get the votes, and votes are what you need to win in the Congress of the United States. The tax structure of this country is a disgrace. If you don't believe it, you ask some bellhop or maid or waiter how much trouble he encounters when the Internal Revenue lights on him to find out what the tax, uh, what the tips income was. Here these poor people already getting virtually no money and then the Internal Revenue says, well, I wonder how many tips you made because you've got to pay the government some more money. Well, we have got to revise the tax laws of this country to be more merciful to the poor. And we can do that. Uh, we can do that if we again uh, are willing to spend most of our time figuring out how to get these votes that we need in the United States Senate, how to get these votes that we need in the House of Representatives. The last thing I want to touch on, and there are many others, but I'll mention this, uh, the last thing I want to touch on is the fact that we have in this country a whole arsenal of legislation with respect to civil rights and the protection of human rights. I'm appalled at the ignorance among knowledgeable people of what this legislation is supposed to do. Now, there's no need to raise the question of whether the Civil Rights Commission has power to do something, because when we put the Civil Rights Commission together and it was passed by the Congress of the United States, it was supposed to be a fact-finding body. And it is not any problem because that agency can point up what's wrong and not do anything about it. It's supposed to be an authentic source of information. But the firepower in the civil rights legislation is found in the Voting Rights Act. It is found in the Equal Employment legislation. It is found in the Public Accommodations legislation. It is found in the whole galaxy of uh, legislation that we have enacted in this country, which is like a great big Cadillac standing in front of somebody's door all newly polished with uh, the seats ready for occupancy and all somebody's got to do is put some gas in the tank and turn on the key. What I think we need to do in this country is to get the gas in the tank of the civil rights car, start that motor up and start up the road for freedom. And I want to nominate somebody to put it in the driver's wheel. I want to nominate Hubert Humphrey to be at the driver's wheel in the Senate of the United States and in the Congress. And I call on all of those who really want to move forward in this country to rally behind that banner and let's stop hanging crepes, let's stop getting in hearses, let's get out there and fight and win what all of us know we can get in a democracy. That's why he's the fourth branch of the government. Uh, Mr. Jimenez, perhaps that uh, since uh, Clarence mentioned, especially in his peroration, the uh, equal opportunity uh, part of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, Title VII, since you served for six years on that commission, you might, in addition to whatever else you want to say, uh, talk about that a little bit. Mr. Warren, Mrs. Warren, distinguished guests. Uh, I want to say just a little bit about the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. I am no longer a commissioner because I supported cease and desist powers for that commission during the Nixon administration and uh, made my statements uh, known to the Senate committee uh, hearing on that particular subject. There was another a colleague of mine here in the audience, and I do not, uh, I won't mention her name, but she went through the same process, and she is no longer a commissioner for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. 
I did enjoy the six years of work there. They were fruitful. There was progress made. There was still an awful lot to be done in that particular area. That commission has to be a first-class commission if it ever is to function properly. At the moment, it is a second-class commission. It needs cease and desist powers unless we get those enforcement powers into that commission, the name of the game for those people who complain, the companies and the unions, is delay. Delay, delay, delay. And we had complaints there of people who would have to wait for two and three years to finally sit down and negotiate, not receive justice, just negotiate and conciliate. And I think that there should be, as Clarence has just mentioned here, a real effort made to make this commission in this next Congress a first-class commission, just like other commissions who have those same uh, types of regulatory powers. They should have cease and desist power. According to the invitation, our particular job is to look, uh, look ahead rather than to look back. In my opinion, there should be an effort made to regroup, dig in, hold the line, bring up the rear, rethink objectives, and reevaluate our position. If we do not, the ground won in the past decade may erode, possibly even be lost. I do not suggest that we will ever return to the blatant discrimination and segregation of the past, but rather that our goal of a truly civil libertarian nation may not be reached for a long time, nor do I suggest the benign neglect of the Nixon administration. My central thesis is that we consolidate the gains in education, employment, voting, housing, and the protection afforded the minorities by the courts, legislation, and executive orders. There are wide gaps to be covered in all of the above subjects. There are minorities that have yet to avail themselves of the opportunities afforded them by the progress in civil rights they helped to create. And I might add that yesterday while we were reminiscing about the civil rights movement, we left out a rather significant group of people, and I want to try to correct that situation while I have the opportunity. In the 50s and the 60s, of course in Texas, one of the panelists here today, Henry, was the one who was taking the lead in the Texas legislature on the issue of civil rights for everyone. In New Mexico, it was Senator Chavez who was taking the lead on these particular issues. In Albuquerque, probably one of the first cities that passed a Public Accommodations Act in 1956 or 7, as I recall, and an FEPC, and it was Senator Chavez, Senator Montoya. In California, it's Ed, Ed Roybal who was carrying the load in those years, the 50s and the 60s. There were others, of course, like the distinguished lawyer, Gus Garcia, who took his case on jury discrimination, the Hernandez case, to the Supreme Court and won. Unfortunately, uh, he was never recognized uh, for his efforts. Uh, unfortunately, uh, the Chicanos at the time did not understand what he had done, and the rest of society hated him for it. Those are some of the individuals in this part of the country that were part of the civil rights movement and they should be included in any kind of participation or symposium or panels or libraries that we may create throughout this nation insofar as civil rights movements are concerned. There are, as I have indicated, other ma matters that must be considered in our attempt to try to reevaluate the situation. The drive for women's rights is developing a full head of steam, and I realize that this kind, this situation must be brought in to the civil rights movement in some fashion, just as I say 
the other ethnic minorities must be brought in at this time. I would like to develop my thesis as presented in my opening remarks by zeroing in on some work that remains to be done among the Spanish-speaking people of the nation. <coughs> I will further narrow the work to education and employment. In summary, A, the Chicano and other Spanish-speaking workers should have 80,000 more jobs in federal employment than they now have. Call it quotas, call it whatever you want. It doesn't really matter to me. I realize, but we need at least 80,000 more jobs, even if, on, even if we just try to measure it on a parity basis. Chicano competition with foreign Mexican labor is an unfair burden on the minority group already saddled with local adverse conditions. C, the employment statistics used to formulate national economic plans and national employment budgets are discriminatory and a new basis must be devised by the Congress. D, the gains made in bilingual education must be solidified and then expanded for languages to the Chicano what color and race is to the black. Private corporations must set numerical objectives for hiring and promotion of Chicanos at the higher levels. We are no longer interested in the entry-level positions. We are already there in large numbers, and I don't see any reason for making any more attempts at manpower programs that get us into the lower levels of jobs. We've got to get into middle management, and into the top level. We are already over-concentrated in the service category, the laborer category, and the unskilled category positions in this nation. And the gap becomes even wider, and the frustrations become even greater, because we are so heavily concentrated here, and absolutely nothing at the official, manager, and the other white-collar categories. One small item, I think, that is a thorn on the side of the Spanish-speaking people is a matter of height requirements that are placed by police authorities throughout the nation. There are large numbers of LEAA funds that are being made available to the authorities in this nation which do not have any kind of stipulation in regard to how they are handled insofar as Spanish-speaking people are concerned. One of them is height requirement. There are so many ridiculous rules and regulations throughout the nation on this issue that uh, I heard one in the state of Washington, if a person is uh, uh, five foot uh, nine inches, he needs uh, uh, four years of college. If he is six foot tall, he needs two years of college. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Albert would need 14 years of college to be able to qualify. <laughs> Just for purposes of just a background, there are about 10 million persons of Spanish surname in the United States. About 6 million are Chicanos who live in the southwestern states of New Mexico, Texas, California, Colorado, Arizona, Nevada, Montana, Wyoming, Oregon, and Washington. A significant number of Chicanos live in the midwestern states of Kansas, Nebraska, Michigan, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Ohio. In Illinois, incidentally, there are more Spanish-speaking people than the combined population of Colorado, Arizona, and New Mexico. People do not realize that there's a tremendous number of Spanish-speaking people who were there many, many years ago. They are the ones that built the Santa Fe Railroad and uh, the Burlington, Quincy, and other railroads that connected with the East. The other Spanish-speaking are Puerto Ricans in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, Illinois, and Washington, D.C. The Cubans reside generally in Florida and along the eastern seaboard, and the South and Central Americans are concentrated in San Francisco, New York, and Washington, D.C. For purposes of some kind of a gauge or measure, the 1970 census shows that about one-third of the Spanish-speaking persons in the United States have incomes below the poverty level. So you get an idea of where we're starting from. Approximately one-third, 1970. Uh, during the Johnson administration, there was considerable improvement in federal government hiring of the Spanish-speaking. The upward trend peaked in the 1967 to 1969 years. Even though the federal workforce was being reduced, the net gain in Spanish-speaking employees was 4,600 for an average of 2,300 per year. In 1970, the net gain fell to 830, and as of now, it is zero, and according to the latest announcements, we, have, we were the ones who were hired last, 
and I suspect we're the ones who are going to be the first ones out whenever the cuts do occur. So there must be some effort made here to hold the line, at least in regard to these people who did not get into this uh, employment situation until uh, late in the game. The economic problems of the Spanish speaking are exacerbated by the policies of the U.S. government with respect to immigration and, and contracting and commuting of workers from Mexico. No other region contends with these problems on a similar scale. No other group in the population is placed in the same continuing competition with the poverty of another nation. During the Johnson administration, the problem was recognized and a start was made by the creation of the Border Commission for Friendship and Development. Unfortunately, the new commission was wiped out by the Nixon administration and we no longer had even that to work on insofar as our relations with the, uh, Mexico. I can understand Mexico's willingness to export some of its unemployment in exchange for commercial trade. What I cannot understand is why the costs of this arrangement are saddled on a group of people that cannot afford it. The U.S. Chicano has been burdened for years with these foreign aid costs, and that's what they are, foreign aid costs. And, 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 and these costs, of course, are paid by the Chicanos in the form of loss of jobs, discrimination, second-class citizenship, low pay, and migrancy. Now, I suggest that I can understand this matter of trading. All I'm saying is, let's divide up the costs among the entire population and not just the mexican American. There is a way to do it, certainly. There is a way, certainly, to deal, make an arrangement with Mexico in regard to either uh, an, an, uh, an economic program. Uh, we've gone so far as to tell the farmers in Turkey to quit growing poppies uh, and paying them for it. So why can't we make arrangement with Mexico to stop this uh, 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 human exploitation. <laughs> Non-citizens from Mexico are the subject of heavy-handed discrimination, which is easily applied to Chicano citizens as well, for there are no differences in the names, features, language, and general characteristics. I do not mean to imply that it is all right to discriminate against non-citizens, but rather that some agreements must be reached to protect the rights of both. I am, of course, opposed to any states approving laws that propose to resolve the problem. California passed recently one that required a person to uh, approve citizenship prior to employment. Fortunately, the law was quickly declared unconstitutional by the courts. The problem must be resolved by agreements between the United States executive and the Mexican government. Finally, the Naturalization and Immigration Service shuttled illegal Mexican aliens across the border by the hundreds. And those of us who are Chicano citizens must think that they're there but for the grace of God go on. The Bureau of the Census recently issued employment profiles on selected low-income areas in 60 cities. For the first time in history, meaningful employment data are available for the Spanish-speaking people. What I found was that in these particular low-income areas throughout the nation, the rate of unemployment, as it is measured, by the standard statistics that we have today is about twice what it is for the rest of the nation. In San Diego, it's 12.7. In Miami, it's 12.2. In Los Angeles, it's 12.1. In San Antonio, it's 10.1. In Denver, it's 9.1 rate of unemployment. But if we dig in into these particular low-income areas, it is not 12.1. It is not 10.1. In Denver, it's 31. This is unemployment and underemployment. In San Antonio it's 35, in New York City for Puerto Ricans it's 43, in Los Angeles it's 31, in Miami it's 27, in San Diego it's 37 percent. Now, I realize that we're dealing with the worst situation in the nation, the low income areas, and these figures reflect it. What I'm saying is that the data, the statistics that on which we base our national plans for helping or assisting people throughout the United States do not reflect the real unemployment situation of the minorities, and that includes the blacks. Finally, language is to the Chicano what color is to the black in the field of civil rights and equal opportunities. Most of the national organizations engaged in the civil rights movement have never given proper consideration to the subject of language as it affects the civil rights of the Spanish-speaking people. 
The national organizations have never given the language issue priority consideration, and what little has been done has been carried out without their participation. The time has come to fish or cut bait on the language issue. There is widening division among the blacks and the Chicano. I, like many others here, have fought to preserve the unity among all people for many years, but the burden is getting heavier, and the local Chicano and white ethnic leaders will no longer support strictly white black priority issues. Perhaps if the white black leadership will include in some of their plans the top Chicano priorities, we might be able to bring together the forces that open so many doors for people of all races, colors, national origins, and religions. Mr. Marshall had to step out for a few minutes, so we recognize uh, Ms. Burke next. Thank you very much, Congressman, uh, Chief Justice, Ms. Warren, and to the distinguished guest here. I would like to address my remarks to that part of Mr. Bond's speech that discussed reaction or appeasement politics. But before I do that, I would like to at least comment on the remarks that were made by Congressman Gonzalez. When he asked the question, uh, why is it we don't see people walking in the streets and marching, and why is it we don't see uh, the overt uh, evidence of discontent? Well, I would hope that we don't misread that and believe that there is not great discontent. The only question is, how is that discontent being manifested? I say one reason that we don't see those evidences of discontent is because there has been almost an organized suppression of leadership among minorities. There has been what we have observed in the past few years, and not only suppression of leadership, but dismembering of the kind of organizations that were probably in great responsibility for part of the changes we saw during the Civil Rights era. And when we talk about the political prisoner, the political prisoner is not a fragment of someone's imagination. It is something that we have witnessed and we are observing today. And to the extent that we're going to have change, we're going to have to have, first of all, recognize that we have to allow people not to have self-destruction, but be able to come together. And certainly, if one of the things that are really preventing progress is the fact that blacks and Chicanos Somehow, often don't identify who the real enemy is. And instead of fighting each other, I hope that we can come together, organize together. And, and if all the minorities of this country and the poor of this country ever came together, we'd have a realignment of parties with redirection. And we would get over some of those things that are now we're seeing as uh, we're, we talk about them as being the quiet uh, effect of the 70s. It's, it's really not quiet because of, of a lack of something to do. It's quiet that's being placed upon us. And uh, part of this is a great danger within some of our political parties. And I suggest that I'm sure that one of the reasons I'm here is because of my activities with the Democratic Party. So I'd like to really address myself to that party. Uh, it is true that we cannot do anything unless we bring Republicans and Democrats together in our agenda. At the same time, I think as within the Democratic Party, which has been traditionally the one that we've looked to in terms of new direction, we have some dangers of appeasement politics. Uh, it is, there's a great danger always when you lose an election. But there's nothing wrong with losing an election. People lose elections all the time. And maybe that's what makes them statesmen. But uh, the danger is when you start looking at opinion polls to direct your future. And to me, the greatest danger today is that the Democratic Party will look around and say, because we didn't win that election, we're not going to give leadership we're going to go back and get, start wallowing in some of this racism and joining with some of those people who are the cause 
of us coming, going back instead of going forward. And to me, the greatest challenge is for the Democratic Party to say, we know that we're made up of people who are very discontented, in, and, and I say not just minorities. We know that there's a grit, the hard hat, the uh, middle America is discontented. But to the extent that we say we're going to then change our position to go over and join Wallace is not leadership. What is needed is not the suppression of leadership or the appeasement or of, of you know, poll politics. What is needed is really an agenda where we say we're going to re-educate middle America. We're going to re-educate them to understand that the reason they can't walk the streets at night is not because we have to start suppressing more people and because we've allowed people to run the street. The reason is because we have not paid attention to some of the priorities that we should have paid attention to. We have to give new direction and new leadership. I hope when we come out of here today, we can say, there are any number of things that we have to address ourselves to. Prison reform is one of those things. We have to address ourselves to the problems of poverty. And it's true, we have to talk about a kind of a tax system that does not keep that little man down there. We've got to talk about a welfare system that gives new hope. But we've also got to talk about new leadership and new responsibility. And this is our agenda, because the civil rights movement is dead, but we're going to have to resurrect it. But it's not going to be resurrected as it was 10 years ago because we know with new times come new methods. Today, we're not going to be able to have the same kind of militancy necessarily that we saw five years ago because we're going to have new methods. What those methods are is what we have to talk about. And we have to give leadership rather than reaction. Uh, Julian, I want to uh, uh, sort of make a, a statement or, and ask you to respond to it as in addition to responding what uh, the people have said on the panel now. Uh, and the statement is, is based <laughs> not only on what has just been said, but on the, all of the speeches, including the Chief Justices and, and uh, Roy Wilkins and your own. Um, it seems to me that uh, that it uh, and the, and also because of what uh, Congressman Gonzalez and Mr. Jimenez said, it, it seems to me that, uh, as I said at the outset, that the agenda of the civil rights movement, which then existed in the uh, '60s, was rather clear, and it was an agenda directed at a black problem. And the black problem was clear, and it was historical. And therefore, it wasn't a uh, minority problem. It was specifically a black problem. And it was caused by the uh, uh, segregation system, which was imposed by law, uh, by law, not just custom, and not just prejudice, but by law um, throughout uh, 17 states, and, and to some extent, uh, riding over, as we will remember, in 19, uh, uh, before 1954, the schools, as well as the restaurants, were all segregated in the District of Columbia, which was the nation's capital. Now, uh, so that the agenda was clear, and it was directed at a black problem, and it was directed at clearing away a problem which faced only blacks. And uh, you could do that through legislation, you could do that by directing yourself particularly at the problem and the executive branch, the legislature branch, and particularly the courts, I think, have uh, largely dealt with it. Well, now, uh, as uh, Senator Humphrey has pointed out, as uh, you have pointed out, as Clarence Mitchell uh, pointed out, uh, the problems that facing are facing blacks are not
problems that are just facing blacks and therefore in a sense are not facing blacks because they are blacks. Uh, they are also facing other minority groups. They are facing the Chicano. They are facing the Puerto Rican. They are facing uh, the American Indian. And they are facing uh, ethnic groups that do not have any uh, uh, racial um, identification. Uh, the, those problems are, are uh, fundamentally uh, economic problems and problems relating to the distribution of wealth and the distribution of services such as health services. It seems to me that uh, we have a problem not just of a political coalition, and not just of uh, putting together groups that uh, will face those problems commonly, but that we also have a problem because we do not know the answers. Uh, we do not have an agenda that, that can be translated into legislation or, or court cases or, or into executive answer uh, that will deal with those problems not only for blacks, uh, but for uh, uh, people that are disadvantaged generally, including whites, Chicanos, uh, Puerto Ricans, American Indians, and so forth. Now, if that is a fair statement of, of uh, what the civil rights movement was about in the past, and a fair statement of, of uh, uh, where we are now, um, how, uh, how do you uh, respond to that? What kind of uh, political action do you think uh, should be taken uh, by people like yourself that are, are black leaders um, uh, to respond to that so that you don't, it doesn't end up in sort of a, a fight for everybody getting uh, his piece of an action which is limited and which is a, a common problem to a lot of people, all of whom need, uh, all of whom need help. Well, first let me say I don't know. Um, I think what you've said is a is generally a fair representation of what the 60s were and what the 70s have turned out to be. Uh, talk about competition between ethnic groups. The one of the poor results of the poverty program has been to pit blacks and and browns against each other for the jobs very down at the bottom and to cause these two groups to compete with each other and to uh, watch the program being removed from above them while they uh, scuffle and fight over. Uh, five and four and six and seven thousand dollar a year jobs. I honestly don't know what the answer is. I think it's a combination of trying to put back together the coalition that uh, was so successful in the era uh, Mr. Mitchell talked about, and which I think has, has just been fractured and shattered. It uh, developed during the Roosevelt presidency and uh, followed through the, the Johnson presidency and began to crumble with the Humphrey candidacy and fell into complete disarray with the McGovern candidacy. And I think the, what's caused it to fall apart is, is a great many different things. Uh, what would put it back together is, is something I have no notion of. But if, if it was generally made up of the, the churches, the unions, uh, what you could call the New Deal Southern liberals, uh, the organized and respectable liberal left, the, uh, the non-white ethnic uh, minorities, and the white ethnic groups in the country, uh, what you've described as happening contributed to it falling apart, that each of these groups became more interested in itself than it was in the whole. Uh, a separatism, not in a racial sense, but in a, in a uh, political sense, became more important than seeking uh, political advantage that would accrue to the, to the total group, and so the, the old coalition fell apart. But how it's to be put back together, I just have no notion. I, I don't think its parts are the same as they once were. Uh, a great deal of the conscience found in some of these groups no longer is there or has gone off in some other direction. Um, it's, it's just beyond me. I read part of, I didn't hear Senator Humphrey's speech, but read part of it. And it seemed to me he was saying what had to be done, uh, that you had to find some way to make a new appeal to these groups of people and to suggest to them that if you pass X piece of legislation uh, dealing with a uh, problem of health, then not only does it affect black people, but uh, uh, Spanish surnamed people, uh, Appalachian whites, uh, Native Americans, and so on. Uh, but how you get the people with the real levers of power in their hand to respond to that in 1972, as they might have in the middle 1960s, I honestly do not know. 
I just just have no notion whatsoever. Um, Clarence, excuse me for just a minute. I have to step out for a minute. I, I want. I was going to. To say something. I was going to ask you to respond to that. Before you do, I want to read a question, and the, uh, uh, this question is from Andy Brimmer, who, as you know, is a member of the uh, Federal Reserve Board and has served in a very distinguished way in that for several years. And hit the question is relevant to this, and so I wanted to read it before I, I stepped out. It says, on the eve of the major breakthrough in civil rights of the 1950s and 1960s, blacks had the technicians, lawyers, etc., and instruments, courts, political action, mass meetings, etc., required for the task. The movement was also guided by a central strategy. Today, the task is economic and the instruments, technicians, and strategy are not so evident. How can these limitations be overcome, and who can provide the leadership? Well, in response to that question, and also what uh, Mr. Marshall said earlier, I would like to say this. It's, I seldom accept uh, agreements and arrangements to participate in panels because it's so hard to keep quiet when something's said when, that you don't agree with. Uh, and the main reason I came down here uh, is because I wanted to pay my respect to President Johnson for the great things that he has done. But I, I would say this with respect to the formulation of what we were fighting for in the period of the 50s, 60s, and even before. As long as I've been in Washington, which is now some 30 years, I have never conceived our objective to be merely getting rights for black Americans. Every piece of legislation that we have tried to formulate, which would cover jobs, housing, and things of that sort, has to do with race, religion, and national origin. And that, that, that caused a big dispute. There were many people who argued that the uh, religion and national origin weren't things contemplated uh, by the uh, Reconstruction period, and therefore uh, maybe we weren't on sound constitutional grounds to include those. Uh, we used to say race, re religion, or uh, something having to do with belief. And many people thought, well, if you say belief, that means you defend somebody who's charged with being a communist. And so why don't we uh, confine it to race, religion, or national origin? That business about the communists never made sense to me. But be that as it may, we had to have a viable working force. And we agreed on race, religion, and national origin. The first time I ever came into this state on government business, it had to do not with discrimination against black people, but discrimination against Mexican Americans. And it was largely because of the Spanish speaking problem that I was down here. When we were working for the uh, 1965 Voting Rights Act, there were some people who thought that they would trip us up by adding an amendment which would help the non-English speaking Puerto Ricans uh, to vote in the state of New York. Uh, to the everlasting credit of Senator Robert Kennedy and Senator Jacob Javits, who could have been affected politically by those uh, decisions, uh, we agreed to have the law rewritten so that the Spanish, uh, the non-English speaking Puerto Ricans, and indeed any other group that uh, couldn't speak English but was entitled to the right to vote, could vote. And I'm happy to say that decision was upheld by the great United States Supreme Court under uh, Mr. Justice Warren. And I, I just think, I wonder what we've been doing in this country all these years when we've had these gigantic things happening and getting uh, the tangible results and somebody comes up and says, it ain't nothing. And I mean it ain't nothing, that's what they say. I, had a, I was a major in English, but I'm purposely using uh, the vernacular. And I, uh, I, uh, I, I find, too, that uh, with respect to the kind of question about economics, this is a terrible mistake. There is no way to separate the things that we have been working for from the economic issues. When you talk about fair employment legislation, you're talking about people getting a job. When you talk about the right to vote, you are electing the people who are going to make the laws to decide whether somebody is going to be put in jail because they erroneously got on a welfare roll. 
There's no way to separate these two things. There is this one thing, and I will go again to the Johnson uh, lexicon. Uh, the president got me over the White House one day and said, Clarence, I'm getting ready to do something that you didn't ask me to do, Whitney Young didn't ask me to do, Roy Wilkins didn't ask me to do, I decided to do it. He said, you've got great lawyers, and everybody knows that. Uh, you have got great doctors and teachers, everybody knows that. But he said, I want the white people of this country to know that you've got great business brains, and I'm going to appoint Andy Brimmer to the Federal Reserve Board. Now, that's the way you do it. You start bringing in and mobilizing the people like Governor Bremer and the people who have economic resources and know-how, uh, bring them into the struggle, not because the struggle is, is on a new dimension, but for implementing the original intentions which, which were to make all of the people of this country the beneficiaries of all the good things in American life. Mr. Marshall, I'm going to inject myself here. Uh, I'm falling victim to what uh, Mr. Mitchell so aptly described as the unavoidable temptation when you get on these panels to put in a little bit. Uh, in view of what was said here with respect to other minority groups, first, in 1957, I don't think that the picture in Texas could have been any grimmer, could have been any more despondent. Uh, in fact, far beyond anything we could hope to conceive as being grim today. I certainly agree with Mr. Mitchell. I think that it'd be a tactical mistake for us to leave here uh, with the implication that some other ethnic minority groups uh, have as a main intention to strangle in separatism. Uh, I think this is not the main thrust. I believe this would be an, an error. I think that the undying gratitude and debt to the American of Negro descent that all of us has cannot be denied. But in 1957, in the, in the middle of the debates here in the state senate with respect to what was called a massive kit of resistance that came down from Virginia and around the southern states, I found to not too much of my surprise